be in your house this morning. We thank you, Father, for your word, for the richness, uh, dear Lord, of the history of our church, for the love that you've given to us, the completed work of your son, Jesus Christ. And as we learn this morning, as we study, and as we talk, and as we, as we our hearts and minds are open to you, we pray, dear God, your presence will be with us, and your word will come alive. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. <laughs> All right, so yes, I am Courtney Guthrie. Um, I'm wife of Fred Guthrie. He's on your pastoral search committee. Please keep praying for them. They're still working diligently. Um, I am also, as he said, a student at Colorado Christian University. I'm studying to get my Master of Arts in Applied Apologetics. Yes, God willing, if I finish, I will be able to put ma <laughs> after my name. Actually, I think it'll just be ma, but I'm kind of already a ma, but... <laughs> So when I tell people I'm studying apologetics, I get one of three reactions. Either they're like, oh, cool. Or they're like, huh? Or they're like, <laughs> I'm not really sure what the last one's about. But I thought I'd take a second just to talk about what apologetics is. Just so if you're wondering or you are a little reserved about it, you'll be able to answer it. So if you look at this verse I've picked, it is the number one verse we go to in apologetics. First Peter 3.15, why? Because the picture that's being presented here is a picture of a courtroom and providing a defense for something. That word defense, that's where apologia comes from. That's where we get apologetics from. Apologia is the Greek word for defense. So that's it. We're just trying to provide a defense. And as I was telling Lou earlier, if your defense is, I once was one way, now I'm completely different, and Jesus was in between. That's what happened. That's a great defense, and there's no problem with that. But there are some people who are like me who require a little bit more. So while we all know it's the work of the Holy Spirit by which we are saved, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, right? But we are exhorted as believers to defend our faith. And... We have to answer all of those who have questions. Now, in this particular verse, it talks about um, people against us, but that could be people right here sitting next to me. I had questions, and I was told I wasn't allowed to ask them. So I didn't like that answer, <laughs> and I'm hoping that I give you some answers so that if somebody asks you the questions, be they your brother or sister right here in church or outside of the church, you'll be able to better answer their questions. So we're going to talk about that. We also want to destroy every argument, lofty opinion. That sounds really ominous, but it has to be in a loving manner. We want to do so in a, my, all of the apologetics teachers say, winsome manner. So that is the word, <laughs> winsome. This man right here, Dr. Gary Habermas, um, he and my professor, Dr. Shaw, work very closely together. And he developed this system that uses well-evidenced and critically accepted evidence to support the resurrection. That's it. That means that <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice because that's just the way things work. <laughs> Excuse me. They use the stuff that non-believers will accept. They're using evidence that non... So when I talk about it, I am in no way discounting any of the other evidence. I'm just saying this is what even non-believers will accept. And these are critically um, accepted by New Testament scholars. So maybe you'll find somebody who's not all that educated. Oh, thank you. I had some water though. Thank you. <laughs> but um, we also are looking for evidence that's historically accepted because we're looking at biographies. We're looking at a history, right? And historians use five principles by which they judge something to be accurate. Uh, they need to have multiple independent witnesses uh, coming from a neutral or hostile source to provide some of that affirmation. Containing eyewitnesses is really important, not hearsay. Uh, testimony <coughs> that's timely, something that's close to the time of the event. And maybe it has some embarrassing details thrown in. That's important as well. So, be thinking of those five principles as I walk through the evidence and see if you see them show up. What? What those five again? We want them to be multiple independent witnesses, neutral or hostile sources, 
eyewitness accounts, <coughs> testimony close in time to the event, and having details that would likely not be fabricated because they're embarrassing. So when I thought about this, I wanted to think of a way for you to remember it. <laughs> so I thought, I want to use the word risen, right? Because that makes sense. And now I want to think of a word for R that means died. <laughs> so I know all of us in here know that when Jesus died, he received the punishment of our sins. So the word for R is received. And that was the best I could do. So I apologize if it's not good enough. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is we want to make sure that we can show that he lived, that he absolutely died. He did not swoon. This is a real man who suffered a real death on the cross. Okay? These are the things we're looking for. So what did I say? I want witnesses that are not necessarily friendly. So the first person we're going to look at is a name that a lot of you probably know. He's a first century Jewish historian, Josephus. And some of you in this room probably know from antiquities that there is a section of antiquities that is so well known, it has its own name. I'm looking at David. Does David know what this is? I don't, I don't know the name. I'm sure I've read it. Though. It's called the Testimonium Flavianum. Flavianum. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Oh, I messed that up. <laughs> There's a little bit of discrepancy over that, though. And that's why that's not what I have up there. Because while all historians accept that, Jewish died, that, Jewish, that Jesus died on the cross, that part of the testimony is accepted. But if you look at that particular section of antiquities, you're going to come into some skeptics who are going to throw at you and see the Christians took over and they just threw stuff in and it's just total fabrication. We shouldn't even look at his testimony. Mm. That's not true. We should. We should. But I'm not including it right here because we don't need it. <coughs> Trust me on this. We don't need it. What we can also find from Josephus is that he supports that Roman soldiers commonly used crucifixion to execute Jews specifically right after the fall of Jerusalem, which was not that far away from the death of Jesus Christ. Then we have Tacitus. He's also someone who is not supportive of Christianity. He's second century, so he's a little bit farther away. But he said Christus suffered the extreme penalty. That's crucifixion. How do I know that? These writers back then thought that crucifixion was so horrid, so extreme, that they said the word crucifixion should be removed from the lexicon. They were humiliated by it. So he's supporting it, and he said that Jesus Christ was executed. Then we have Lucian. He's a Greek satirist. He's making fun of us. Again, somebody in history who is not a friend. He's not trying to support Christianity. And he says that those crazy Christians worshipped a crucified man. Again, another piece of history close to the time of Jesus' death. Then we have this poor soul who's a Syriac philosopher. I believe he was first century, so again, we're close to Jesus' death, who's saying that they were saying the wise king of the Christians was executed. Now, it doesn't say that he was crucified in this particular passage, but he was executed. And then last but not least, we have the Talmud. Who else can we cite that's further against us than the very Jews themselves who put him to death? And they said that Yeshu was hanged on the eve of Passover. Hanged might make you think of something different, but if you see, I've got Acts 10.39 here. That says we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. So even the Christians were reporting it in this manner. So this supports our testimony that Jesus died by crucifixion at the time that they reported him dying. I apologize for this next section. It's hard. It's hard for me to talk about. But it's important for you to get in your mind a very clear picture of Jesus's body. So we start at the Garden of Gethsemane. 
where he's praying and it says he sweated blood in it. And there are some people who will balk at this and say, you can't sweat blood. Jesus was under extreme stress. There's a medical condition known as hematidrosis. And that condition is when you're so stressed, you cause your capillaries to break open. Those capillaries located close to the skin surface will be touched by the sweat glands as it excretes sweat through the pores. And it will pull that blood out with it and make it appear as though you're sweating blood. This is a known condition. Now, some of you will think, gosh, no, I mean, I've been in pretty stressful positions. I haven't sweated blood. And there were lots of people who were executed who didn't sweat blood. But I want you to picture Jesus. In this room, I'm fairly certain we all know that God is one being, three persons, who were eternally together in relationship. And Jesus was about to undergo not just what I put on him, not just what you put on him, but the entire breadth of God's wrath. I think I would sweat blood if I thought I was going to get just what I deserve. I think it's a fairly accurate description. But putting that aside, after this farcical trial here, they hand him over to some of the most brutal executioners, some of the most brutal beaters in the land. They took great pride. There's a question of how many times he was whipped. Jewish law says that you can't go past 40 because 40 is the death penalty. So it's always 39, but they're not under Jewish law. These guys know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're looking for. And they know when they can quit without killing someone. So I don't know how many times he was beaten. But I do know that they used leather strips where they tied metal balls onto them. And that was the purpose of slamming into the body and creating deep contusions. That just is making it softer, easier to rip apart. Then they would tie in some sharp bone fragments so that it would grab the skin each time it hit and rip down the body, stripping away layers of skin into the muscle, stripping away layers of muscle. There are reports of people being laid bare to the bone. There are reports of people having their bowels exposed. Whatever Jesus' condition, I can guarantee he was bleeding profusely, and that leads to hypovolemic shock. Lee Strobel interviewed this doctor, Dr. Alexander Methrell, in his book, <clears throat> The Case for Easter. It's a cheap book, really easy to buy and give out to any of your friends, family members. Um, and it goes through a lot of this evidence in a nice, quick, concise form. He says the blood loss and the gaping open wounds would have left him nearly dead just from the beating of him. I'm really sorry. We've got to go through this, and I'll explain it in just a minute. So what are the consequences here? Well, we know that he was tired because we know that he was bleeding a lot. We know that he was weak because... When they hand him the piece of the cross that he has to carry to his execution spot, he can't even carry it. He can barely walk. So they give it to somebody else, right? <coughs> so they get him to his spot, and they use these five to seven inch nails to drive his hands outstretched onto this beam through the median nerve and through his feet, also on a median nerve. If you've ever hit your funny bone, you have a shadow of a feeling of that pain. His was constant. Then they hoist up this beam and dislocate his shoulders. Right now, some of you are thinking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> you know, they didn't use to number the songs. They referred to them by the first line. This song, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, has my bones are out of joint. 
Jesus is suffering, and he cannot breathe because his chest is locked in an exhale position as he's hanging down. Every time he wants to exhale or inhale position, every time he wants to exhale, he has to scrape his open back up that cross on those splinters to get the breath that he needs. So think of that when you're reading these stories, these accounts of his last words. Each time he has to get air to do it. This is going to lead to respiratory acidosis. That's a condition where the CO2 levels or the carbon dioxide levels rise up in your bloodstream. It's going to cause um, heart arrhythmia. That's when your heart starts beating irregularly. And then it's going to lead to arrest. He also still has that hypovolemic shock going on. That's also going to contribute to the heart failure. And that's also going to lead to a condition where the fluid, uh, the membranes around the heart and the lungs will contain fluid or retain fluid. Why is that important? Because John says one of the soldiers pierced him in the side and out came blood and water. Hmm. These are biographical accounts of what happened. Now, I put down at the bottom here, it's really small, I don't know if you're in the back can read it, but it does say blood and water, it doesn't say water and blood. In our language, we tend to put things in order that they happen, and that time, they did it in order of prominence. So John was struck by the blood, even though the water probably came out first, medically speaking. So if somebody hits you with that, well, it can't be true because it would have happened this way, you can say, no, that's just how they wrote at that time. John was struck by the blood. It is finished. Why am I doing this? Because we have to establish that Jesus died. There are a group of people out there who believe that he didn't exist. First of all, there are some mythicists out there. They're fewer in number. And there are a group of people out there who actually think he swooned and faked it. He faked dying on the cross. That's what they're going to say. I'm thinking of the Muslims right now. That's one of their leading theories. These Roman soldiers, they were expert killers. And there were two other people crucified at the same time, and they had their legs broken. And Jesus didn't. That was the first confirmation that he died. Second is the fact that the soldiers themselves, if they fail in their mission, suffer the penalty that they were supposed to impose. It does not behoove them to lie. Adding to it, Pontius Pilate himself says, hey, are you absolutely certain he's dead? Because they want me to hand over the body. So we have the enemies affirming he died. Meanwhile, let's talk about the fact that Jesus was stabbed with the spear. That spear either went into his heart, that's instantaneous death, or it went into his lungs, which is what they're proposing. He swooned because it went into his lungs. But if it went into his lungs, you've you got to trust me on this, there would be a noise. There would be an audible sound coming from that every time Jesus breathed. So... He absolutely died. He did not swoon on that cross. It is not fabricated. This is established evidence that's accepted by critical scholars. Now we get to the eye. All right. Word of the day. Interred. I had to think of an I word for put them in a tomb. <laughs> so if you don't know what interred is, it means they put them in a tomb, usually with the funeral rites. So R. <laughs> He received our punishment and death. I, he's interred in a tomb. How do we know this? There's a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. Is he a real person? Again, keep in mind, the Gospels are four separate accounts. They come in one nifty book for us, but they are four separate accounts, four separate testimonies. And the Gospels affirm. Yep, he's a real person. This burial is already accepted by a majority of those New Testament scholars. Remember, we're looking for that historically accepted evidence. So what do we know about him? 
We know he's rich. We know he's good. We know he's a sympathizer in fear. I'm going to explain that in a second. And we know he's in a hurry. I'll explain that right after I explain the first one. All right. Why is the, why is he in fear? Well, he's on the council. He's on the council that just condemned Jesus. It says he wasn't there though. He meant he skipped the meeting. So when you read the account that says everybody voted to put him on that cross, everybody there did. He wasn't there. He hid. And then it says he's in a hurry. Why? Because it's Passover, right? We got to get the body buried in time. So he's got to find a tomb that's close by, easy to get to, that he can put a body in. And he reveres Jesus, so he wants to make sure it's a nice burial. So he offers his own. Yeah, he's a real guy. We not only have all four Gospels, but we have 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to be pointing to that particular chapter a lot. Why? Because these first verses, all the way up through, I think, 8 or 9, are the early creed of the church. That means people in the church at the beginning of the church were reciting this in the same way that we recite a creed today. They couldn't read. They couldn't write. They had to have some way to remember the important details. And they were reciting this, that Jesus died and Jesus was buried in a tomb. Then we have Mark's passion story. I put that in there because Mark, this his gospel is actually considered written earlier than the other gospels by most New Testament scholars. And they are now suggesting that the passion story was actually written first. It was most prominent on his mind. And that could have come at AD 37, which means just a few years after Jesus died. Again, we're looking for testimony that occurred relatively close to the time of the event. S. Surprise! <laughs> For those of you who just thought of Rick, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to get at. It was not a surprise that Jesus was hanging out and behind the tomb door waiting to surprise Mary. That's not what I'm suggesting. Actually, this works in our favor. It was a surprise to the disciples. They were not expecting an empty tomb. They were freaking out. They were terrified. They were hiding. Peter denied him three times. They didn't know there was going to be an empty tomb in spite of the fact that Jesus told them over and over again that this was going to happen. So yet another embarrassing detail from our disciples. So how do we know it was empty? Get ready for embarrassing detail number two. The women found it. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that so awful, Courtney? Okay, for all you women lenders, I'm sorry. I have to read these words. Oh, you know what? I didn't do my studious thing, and I'm about to read. I have to look very studious for you. Here we go. Wow. I, I got to pull off the studious look. <laughs> now you'll think I'm smart. See, y'all weren't following me until now. Um, so the women discovered the tomb, and this is what the Jews felt like about women's testimony. Let the words of the law be burned rather than delivered to women. Whoa. Blessed is he whose children are male, but woe to him whose children are female. Yeah, it was akin to a robber's testimony. It wasn't admitted in court. Uh, Joseph, Josephus in antiquity says, because of the levity and boldness of women, they are like servants in testimony and should not be admitted. Boldness. And boldness. We are. <laughs> they would be most disappointed this morning. <laughs> okay, so it's also attested to by our enemies. Jewish polemic suggests it. This is, uh, polemic is just the argument that they were making at the time. So what happens when the tomb is found empty? What do the Jews say? They say, they, carry it away. they stole the body. <laughs> What they did not say is the body's still in the tomb. They're admitting it. They're saying it. This tomb is right there in Jerusalem. <laughs> Jesus is put to death there. 
Jesus was preaching there. Jesus is buried there. Jesus' tomb is found empty there. All in this relatively small area. All they got to do is go look. Where's the body? It's gone. Why? Because they stole it. So that's what we have to argue against. How do we know they didn't steal it? Well, we'll get to that. First of all, the tomb was secure. Remember I talked about some people will say Jesus swooned on the cross. They're suggesting that this mostly dead man surprisingly took a breath and found himself in a tomb, pulled off the shroud, Herculean miracle moved this giant tomb door out of the way, and came out looking not like he needed a doctor, like, but like the Lord of life. It's quite the claim. I find that more miraculous, actually. <laughs> so what, how do we know how secure it was? It was that we've got a picture up there. Make sure I get the right thing. I don't know if it was exactly like this. I think this is a little bit fabricated. But they had this kind of chiseled out large stone that would roll down. It would make a little roll down crevice area that they could roll it down into in front of this little opening. And then they would have another little stone that they would stick in to secure it. So, yes. <clears throat> and it's attested to in all four Gospels. Again, four separate testimonies. And Paul implies that there was an empty tomb. Where? What did I say? First Corinthians 3.15. I mean, 15.3.5. It's our early creed. They were preaching it right there in the church. Saying it. Believing it to be true. Here's where it gets exciting. We have eyewitness accounts. So what are we arguing about at this point, there are there actually is a growing number of people who suggest that this part, getting past all the other evidence we have, this part is hallucinogens. They were hallucinating. So how are we going to argue that they weren't hallucinating? Well, they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they saw him as single people single person, multiple people inside, outside. They ate with him. They drank with him. They heard him. These are not the situations that you would experience if you were hallucinating something. How do we know they were saying it? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. <laughs> he gives a list of all of those people that saw him, saw Jesus. And last of all was me, Paul says. He saw Jesus. It was actually a requirement to be an apostle to have seen Jesus alive after the resurrection. The Gospels testify to this, all of them, just a few times. <laughs> I snuck in Acts on the bottom here, but that just that just affirms this part. You got like this. Um, but yes. And then you'll have somebody, I'm sure, one of you will come across the person who says, but Paul says to the 500, well, it says others. I think you have to remember that each gospel is written by a different person who has a different perspective that they're bringing and that they found most important to present. And while Paul was talking, he wanted to present the fact that there was a large group of people. These people didn't think that large groups were important. You needed to have the names of people to go and talk to. Who do I go and ask? Who do I say, are you sure you saw him? What did he look like? How do I know you really, really saw him? By the way, I'm not going to be reading every single verse that comes up, so I highly suggest you use pictures <laughs> or <and> look them up because <laughs> I have a lot to get through and I don't want to miss anything. But um, I will have, I didn't talk about that last point, I will have um, these posted online when I post the video online. Okay, and then we have the sermon summaries in Acts. All right, so Peter's preaching it, Paul's preaching it. What's important about this is they're doing it right there in Jerusalem, again. They didn't wait a long time. They didn't try to get too far away so people couldn't check up on them. They did it right there. 
Now, some people will go, oh, yeah, but it took 50 days before acts started being recorded. So at the longest amount of time that could have happened was 50 days. They can't pull out a body 50 days later and you say, yeah, that's Jesus. That's why they didn't do it. We got some pretty good skeptics out there who are ready to try to tear you apart. You gotta be ready for it. <laughs> 50 days. Granted, the body would have been decomposed quite a bit, but his hair still would have been the same, his stature still would have been the same, his wounds still would have been visible. People would have still been able to discern that it was Jesus. And even if they couldn't, enough of a stir would have been caused that people started, would have started leaving the church. They would have started questioning, oh, but they brought out the body. And yet not one early apologist wrote and anything about bodies being brought out. The only thing they argued at the time was that he was not stolen by the disciples. They didn't feel a need to argue that because the body was never produced, because they didn't have a body to produce, because... He walked and he talked. So, where does this bring us? New lives and new attitudes. That's how we know. That's how we're assured. We have evidence that their lives were absolutely transformed. These men had done everything for Jesus. They gave up everything for Jesus. They had abandoned family issues and and fishing boats, and they followed him wherever he went, and then he died a very dishonorable, cursed death on a tree. This is not what they were expecting. This is not what they signed up for. They were very upset and terrified that they were going to be caught out in the same way. And then suddenly, they're in Jerusalem, putting their lives at risk, defending Jesus' resurrection. Wow, that's quite a fast turnaround. Well, how do we know they were willing to die? How do we know that they were willing to suffer? Maybe they did it because they thought they were going to get a really cool Ferrari. Maybe they thought they'd get their G6, and they just weren't expecting all this. No, they, they saw what happened. They saw what happened to Jesus. They saw what happened to Stephen publicly executed in a humiliating fashion where the audience actually has to participate. The crowds were in an uproar, and they stoned him to death. They were also recorded as having been imprisoned, having been threatened, having been imprisoned, having been beaten and threatened. They watched him die. And while they did scatter a bit, they never stopped preaching, and their response was to offer praise and prayer. That is quite the change. But the biggest changes came from James and Paul there. We have all these early church people who wrote about these men suffering and dying for the message. <coughs> all of them testifying that they went and they suffered, and they were executed, and they did it with praise and prayer. So who is James? James is Jesus' half-brother. What do we know about him? Well, John 7, 5 says, even his own brothers did not believe in him. These are people who clearly heard what Jesus had done. They had heard about his miracles. The Jews were actually recording that Jesus was luring people away with his sorcery, which means that they were testifying that Jesus was doing amazing things. And they didn't believe. But now suddenly he becomes a pillar of the church. Acts 15, verses 13 and 19, and Galatians 2, verse 19. He is the leader of the church. Paul, he's extraordinary. He hates these people. I see artists 
to pee on the cross and I get offended, angry offended, that is what he felt like they were doing to his God. He was angry and he wanted to call them to account. He was holding the robe of people as they stoned Stephen. He was wanting them all extinguished. Now all of a sudden he's willing to suffer and die. Now all of a sudden he's preaching that he saw, witnessed Jesus Christ in person. And now he's willing to die for it. So what does this tell us? Well, let's look at what Jesus tells us it's supposed to say. He says it's a sign. God gave some people a bonfire and they were so explosive in their desire to appease him that they killed all the prophets of Baal. And I think that's a pretty minor sign compared to what Jesus did. I'm not suggesting people go kill anybody. <laughs> Let's just put that on the record right now. <laughs> there are no prophets of Baal that need to go be extinguished. Uh, <laughs> just means we need to get out there and tell them what Jesus said it means. It means that he is fully God because he said he was fully God. How do we know that? John tells us, I and the Father are one. Truly, truly, I say to you, no one's going to the Father except through him. I am. I am. Where's that from? Sounds familiar. <laughs> Matthew records them worshiping him. He didn't say, no, 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 no. He accepted the worship because he knew he was fully God. He said that we are all sinners. We all have sinned and need a savior. We are guilty of murder and adultery. He said that our hearts are filled with evil. But he said, hey, I'm here to pay the price for you. I will redeem you. Why do I bring all this up? Well, first of all, this is church. <laughs> but second of all, the point of this whole thing is to get you to the feet of the cross. And Jesus is telling us right here, his message is saying, we're sinners in need of a savior. And that's important because he was slaughtered and then he was resurrected so that we could be forgiven. And that resurrection serves, serves as a sign that everything he said is true. If Jesus was a heretic, if Jesus lied about it all, God would not have raised him from the dead. Where does it say that? Right there. The point of the resurrection was to validate the message. It's the centerpiece of what we believe as Christians. It is the foundation of our religion. And it is a sign that the Father accepted the sacrifice for our sins. And what does that do for us? It gives us assurance. Beautiful assurance of the forgiveness of our sins that we will enjoy a resurrected body just like Jesus he was the model for us he had a resurrected body we will have a resurrected body that we will get to enjoy eternal life these verses are going to point to where it says that the resurrection gives us assurance of these things. And it validates us in our work right here, right now. Here's the thing. 
A Gallup poll recently was taken. 30%, 30% reply that the Bible is filled with fables and myths, with a little bit of history thrown in. That's what we're up against, is people thinking that we are feeding them tooth fairy, various other mythical figures stuck in the Bible pages because it was written by men to subordinate women. But this resurrection validates our work to get the word out. It validates us right here, right now, every day, every moment that we're breathing, that we have a job to do. I think it's called the Great Commission. <laughs> That's what I love about this particular apologetic, because I can give you the arguments for God. Talk about the universe beginning. We can talk about the finely tuned uh, laws that are in play. I can give you lots of evidence that will get you to God. This one, this historical case that I am making gets you right to the feet of the cross. Lastly, it provides great hope when we're grieving. You know, a lot of you have experienced grief. Dr. Habermas, the one who I just talked about doing the work of setting this up, his wife, his beloved wife, developed stomach cancer and she had a very short time to live. And he had to watch her go from her vibrant, beautiful personality to death in just a short period of time. And he was devastated. And his students called him and said, aren't you glad you know that the resurrection was real? And he said, yes, I am. <clears throat> because he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Or he received the penalty of our sins on the cross and died. I, he was interred in a tomb. S, surprise, that tomb was found empty. E, eyewitnesses saw him, talked to him, and in. We all get new life. Thank you so much. If you have any desire to learn more, there is the website for Dr. Habermas. The second website is for my professor, Dr. Shaw, who works with Dr. Habermas. They are both currently writing books. This one's uh, writing a book on the New Testament. This one's writing a giant book along with this one about everything I just told you about. And I just did it in 45 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Uh, Frank Turk has a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. <laughs> That's a, it's, it goes right along those lines. He's, uh, he takes it in a more uh, a bigger approach. Question? Okay. So Jesus uh, was brutally beaten. He's nailed to the cross. He can't move his arms. They eventually... Roman soldier eventually stabs him inside, blood and fluid come out. I never really totally understood why Jesus really couldn't breathe that well, you know, even with that, until you said that probably both his shoulders, both of his shoulders were dislocated. There was some weight coming down and popping his two shoulders. If that's true. First off, I don't know if that's stated anywhere, whether it's in the Bible or any 
that's just uh, archaeology is showing that through executions in this manner, that's typically what is bound to happen. Having served on a rescue squad and responding to dislocated uh, joints, that joint cannot be moved at all unless that person is screaming their legs out. Yeah, he's having to push up on his legs to do it. So, on the nail. On the nail on his feet, yeah. All of that aside, forget about the nails. I mean, that's bad enough. Right? But if you dislocate, if, if it's true that he dislocated one of those shoulders, to me, that gives me a finality of why it's so hard to breathe. Because every time you take a breath, it goes right through the whole of her torso. And it would have been excruciating for him to even breathe. So he probably would have been hyperventilating much of the time because he couldn't take a full breath. I, I just wish there was something somewhere that said, oh, yes, Jesus, you know. Off the shoulder or two because I mean that would take your argument like to the next level of, of what it was like for him to die and why it would have been impossible for him to have survived all of that, even if they took him down off the cross. Just that movement alone would be screaming. Yeah, and every medical expert that they are talking to, this is medical experts who are atheists are saying he definitely died. There's no if and or but. He died. These are people who do not agree with Christianity. And they, they all go, anybody who went through that is dead. So to have anybody back then say, oh, you know, he must have thrown the shroud off and moved the stone himself. Yeah, if you just, not this you just moved you couldn't even move on that stone. That would be superhuman. And, and yeah. 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 Well, they, they were asleep. They were asleep. <laughs> the only guards was. If they failed their mission, they were dead. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I mean, how is it that a stone is rolled with no noise? Yeah. Now, I see, mean, some atheists now are now claiming that the Roman guards, being only in Matthew, they're kind of saying, well, maybe the Roman guards weren't even there. They're trying to throw that at you. But we've got the Jews actually saying that they were there. You've got the Jews going, the guards fell asleep. Oh, but that's also in Matthew. Well, we don't absolutely need those guards. Because that tomb was still closed. That's how they did it. That's known. That's not that's, just that's closed, that's but closed and chopped. It there was another stone chopped. And another stone. chalked in. And that stone would have had to roll uphill. Right. Against the chalk. It's not going to happen. Another <laughs> thing about the mentioning uh, Simon of Cyrene helped Jesus carry the cross. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was the guy who asked uh, carried for the Carriage for the body? Joseph of Arimathea. He had Nicodemus also. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I've got to look at that. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. The book I'm reading suggested that maybe a couple weeks ago, because they expected to have to be a little they expected somebody to be there because they were going there to prep the body for, you know, a perfume on it or something. But um, I'm no, I have not heard absolutely that some of the men that were with them, that it was disciples, they may have thought that the guards would help them. They may have thought that just somebody grounds people. Because, you know, when Mary first sees it, the first thing she says is, what did you do with my Lord Savior's body? <laughs> She's not tempted. By the way, none of them thought that the empty tomb meant anything. They didn't think that they were going to see Jesus. Still, they thought the women were crazy. So that's why I'm kind of, I'm not sure whether they were there or if they just thought somebody would be there to help them. But yeah, yeah, that's a question I've heard. One skeptic I saw recently is suggesting that Jesus had a twin. And <laughs> <laughs> they went and got the twin and they brought him in to act as Jesus. That's the latest one I've heard. So there you go. Okay, Lou, would you pray for us and pray for Matt? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this uh, opportunity to listen to more about Jesus, uh, about his resurrection and his uh, death. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. And thank you, Courtney, for teaching us uh, lesson. Thank you, Lord. Through Jesus, we pray and give thanks. Amen.